You guys ready to take on ecumenism? Yeah. I can't take it. I can't take it on. I, I mean, mean <laughs> that'll be father taking it on. <laughs> like, okay, you know. All right. I well, think I actually I have a lot of questions about this. So Okay. All I right. think a lot of people have a lot of questions about it. Yeah, it's it, it, is it like in the air or something? It's, it's... Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm going to ask Father and Cyprian, if you guys could go back and tell your younger selves one thing, what would it be? Because I know mine. I'll give you guys a second to think. Mine would be that when you get like, in a conversation with a lot of people and someone says like something like awkward or weird, don't be looking for like a giant bell to go off and be like everyone like acknowledge what happened like at that moment like most likely it's going to cold like ripple through the like the flow of people there like this like cold shock wave and everyone's just going to go home and disperse and talk about it like yeah what was with that thing that like john said what was up with that and be like i don't know john's been going through it lately and i'm just would tell myself i would just be like that's not a real thing like that hasn't actually <laughs> happened to me in like the last couple of weeks or anything. there is no john john is not a real person but but that would probably go back and be like, hey, by the way, just so you know, a lot of stuff people just don't talk about when they get older. So be ready for that. What about you guys? Mine's, mine's similar to yours. And I think it's um, uh, enjoy and relish saying I don't know as an answer. Hmm. Like cultivate and say I don't know a lot more. Yeah. Like the all so much good stuff has happened in my life when I'm actually it's it it hasn't necessarily been in my nature and I wasn't raised around a lot of people who were comfortable with I don't know. But um man, such good things have happened in my life when I've said I don't know. And I would tell my I would definitely tell my younger self, say I don't know a lot more. Hey Cyprian, do you listen to Andrew WK? No. Well, you I should don't. listen to one song and it's called I Don't Know. <laughs> there you go. The whole song is like I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know That's what to it. do yeah. all the yeah. time. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. It's like my anthem. Mm -hmm. Like whenever I'm feeling like kind of murky inside, sometimes I'll just listen to that. Be like, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing everything I can. Mm -hmm. What about you, Father? Yeah, yeah I think I would say uh, just keep going. Um, in the context of that, it's like so many times I've like, you know, if I just kept doing push-ups like I like I was, I'd be like yoked and just like crazy right now. If I kept doing scales and just, you know, like all the stuff I've done where I started and I stopped, if I if I just did a little bit and just built off of that. So that's what I tell my younger self. Just just do a little bit, but keep going. Don't don't stop. Mm -hmm. Also say lay off the video games. That's the other thing I would tell my younger self. Be like, hey, they're not so important later on. So, but I would, I would tell my younger self the same thing. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I, can I throw in one more extra? I'd tell my younger self, I'm going to go bald. So <laughs> 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 enjoy it now while you can, my man. And I would have grown that bad boy. I'm going to look like Basquiat. I'd have been like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's go for I it. I love it. Hey, I guess it. what? Father, I don't get that reference. I'm just gonna say it. I don't know. I don't Basquiat? know. Basquiat? Yeah, I don't oh, know. Jean the, the, the painter? The painter? Jean Michel? No. He's like a uh, hung out with Andy Warhol. Crazy I, art. I okay. barely know okay. Who Andy Warhol. Okay. Okay. Do you know anything? No. Nope. Whatever. Radiohead. Do you know who Radiohead is? Yes, I know Radiohead. Okay. So, uh, do you know the album OK Computer? Yeah. Like 
Kid A and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that type of art, it's not Basquiat, but all that is like inspired mm-hmm. by like Basquiat. Mm-hmm. Okay. Was it just like a poser? Is like trying to be Basquiat? No, it, no. Some might be like, what are you talking about? But trust me, like, like he, so much of that kind of deconstructionist art is like, it's all, it's all Basquiat. So just to kind of give you some, some reference. He was over the top, bro. He he dated Madonna. Okay. Like he's yeah, he's but I mean when she was like on the come up. Yeah. Like when when she was like just like playing shows at borderline CD. stuff. Like even like yeah. like way before that. She's, yes. Yes. Like New York, like New York art scene. You know, he was in like a post punk kind of band that like was doing looping and mm-hmm. like you know the name of the band. Like proto, like proto hip hop stuff. Oh, he was super influential on hip hop. Like super like, influential. Like proto hip hop. So like, yeah, mm-hmm. Jean Michel. And and just to help you, there's a really great uh, movie called Basquiat. Okay. Um, uh, was that his nickname? David Bowie. David Bowie. No, that's his real name, Jean Michel yeah. Basquiat. Jean he was oh, Haitian, yeah. I think. He was. Yeah, yeah Haitian. he's Haitian. David yeah. Bowie plays. Um, um, Andy Warhol and um, Denicio uh, del Toro plays like one of his best friends and stuff. That's it's right. A, yeah, it's a great movie. It's a great movie. So if anyone doesn't know who Jean Michel is, you should like at least watch that movie. It's one of my wife's and I's favorite movies. Like, yeah, I love my wife. We went to art school together. It was great. We, that's that's like a bond, like like Basquiat's like a bonding uh, kind of connective tissue for us. It's good stuff. Until what I an, like, what an intense figure. Oh man. I mean, oh man. Wow. Yeah. And it's so funny because there's a he was able to take so many aspects of like culture and art that had kind of always been there, but he pushed them to like the forefront to such an extreme that like, yeah, yeah. I mean, truly. He's like one of the last great artists, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because everything after that is just like. Are there any good artists anymore? You two art guys. I think contemporary art ruined it. Mm-hmm. Like this, this just the, 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 the like the Damien Hirsch stuff and all of that. Because when you're paying like, you know, fifty five like like Charles Saatchi paying like fifty five million dollars for a room full of oil, it's like, come on, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what are we, what are we doing here? Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go somewhere where, where it's tough or a lot of people don't want to follow me, but um, there's some cats who. How about Dan Seagram? There's some cats who like are really uh, good, but people there would we'll just look at them as so lowbrow. Mm. Um, but like Alex Gray is one of them. Alex Gray, is a, he's like an incredible, incredible artist and, in every you know kind of sense, every every meaning of the of the word, um, but because he's low, he's so lowbrow, people won't really give him. I think kind of his due, you know. Um, what about you know? Dan Seagram? I don't know Dan Seagram. But he does all those metal album covers, Father. I thought you'd know who Dan Seagram was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He does yeah. a lot. He's okay. I mean, I don't really. Yeah, like him. I mean, I mean. I see the thing is is like to me when you say artist like I would consider Dan Seagram more of like an illustrator oh, sure. in, in, in that in that sense like and what would you say that is because for me like an artist is a much more um holistic almost comprehensive statement it isn't just mm-hmm. like oh I paint pictures you know what I mean like when I when Love I get, that's the definition of an artist is I <laughs> paint pictures. Right. Right. I don't well, you I'm, know I'm, I'm poking it, fun. I don't know what I'm talking about. You can keep going. I don't know what you're I talking mean, about. You know, you know what's interesting? Like, so I I had an art gallery in, in Vegas, and that was like the culmination of my sort of my, right. my art. Uh it was like my my art journey, right? So it's like I just became I became obsessed with street art when I was in LA and then like just met all these artists. I think, you know, these muralists in particular, like I was just obsessed with like graffiti, but no. So like 
like my favorite is Mir One. He's become a friend of mine like over the years, but it's just like these gigantic, huge murals, political in nature, you know what I mean? Super metaphorical, like all of the, like just brilliantly complex. But what I'm realizing even sitting here thinking about this is that like what it was that I valued in that art, like Elmac and Retina, like all these, if I really look at what it was that I loved about these pieces, it's what's, it's what, it's the icon. Mm. Like, that's, what's really so crazy about it is that like, if I had found the icon before I found this, like I would, because there's, there was something that spoke to like the spiritual in me, right. About this public display is mm. really about like figures, right. In a, with a mystical context, but always something missing. So always not fully fulfilling. And it's just so weird sitting here thinking about this now that it's like the icon, it, the icon must be the pinnacle of art. Well, it is for sure. For sure. And I, and I mean, what's interesting is that like, I, I'm looking back at all of my favorite artists. I mean, some of them really almost explicitly and overtly there's a connection like Alphonse Mucha, who's, I mean, he's another one, like I always told, you know, I told people it's like, now Alphonse Mucha is one of the reasons why I married my wife. You know, we, mm. we shared a love for Alphonse Mucha long before orthodoxy. Long, and like mm. Alphonse Mucha has, I mean, he was a Slav. So his, his orthodox, quote unquote, you know, his Byzantine influence is like explicit. It's in there. Not And like, mm. once you become orthodox, you look at it like, oh yeah, obviously, you know, but there's there's all these things i mean even getting back to i brought them up earlier like alex gray like there's there is this uh this place in where you know good art you i mean it's just like you said good art utilizes all these things that um are in the icon but they stop short you know what i mean and mm -hmm. um yeah it, it's kind of funny because I think that plays out in a lot of other areas too. Like, I think a lot, I mean, just, I think a lot of people might understand what I'm saying here, but in the same way in talking about, you know, quote unquote, um, art versus the icon, it's, it's very similar to um, psychoanalysis and, mm. and spiritual counsel. It's like, there's, there's overlap there, but, you know, where psychoanalysis, you know, comes up short, that's almost like right where, you know, the neptic tradition, the, 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 the spiritual tradition um, really kind of like starts to take off. You know what I'm saying? It's, I find it to be the same thing with, you know, quote unquote art and the icon, you know? That's so, yes. So I have that, that is, it's the exact same, it's the exact same pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I have uh, two things to say really quick. One, I think Alex Gray, I was looking at some of his art really quick, and I think he actually did the in interior art for a Beastie Boys album. So I think I actually knew who Alex Gray was. But and then the second thing is, is like a light like like shot through me when I realized I do know a modern day artist and I love him. And that's Frank Quietly, because Frank Quietly is now transitioned oh. from like being a comic book artist, like a full blown like he does like murals and sculptures and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah, he's like, I, I think he only does the occasional cover. Mm -hmm. He's not like an interior artist anymore. Like he's That's like, great. yeah, his murals are dope. I absolutely love his murals. So yeah, very quietly is great. Yeah. I mean, the murals, the mural, the mural, ha it, it, it must be derivative well, the, of well, the, yeah. religious art, right? Well, the, like it's well, the, the mural seeks to tr seeks to give you a similar experience as, as i mean when you walk in a church right an orthodox church proper you're Im you're immediately immersed in the iconography you know it, the scale right the scale and the breadth of the work i mean and that's what a, that's what a mural seeks to do as well you know what i mean so and it's interesting that there's like that golden age of the mural and you look at like you know when when they're being commissioned for 
kind of like government works and these types of things. And this, this interesting Promethean, almost Luciferian celebration of man, as mm -hmm. opposed to a celebration of God, mm -hmm. you know, like in the early 1900s mm -hmm. and it's just like all, or Soviet, right? Yeah. Like the Soviet murals, the Bolshevik murals and all of that. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly it's, it. It's the inversion. It's an inversion of the, it's, it's an inversion of the iconography in a church. Yep. It's like, here's the state. Here's our religious imagery of the state inverted. Very. Yep. I mean, they well, took down the icon. That, that's going to come up again if we are talking about what we're talking about. That's going to come hey, up. Oh. Hey, hey, oh. Okay. Well, right. what are we talking about, Andrew? Well, like I, I was going to say, like, yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. So what we're going to talk about tonight is the part of the creed where it says, um, so we have, uh, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, in the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, in one holy and Catholic apostolic church. So I said tonight when we were talking about if we were going to do a recording tonight or if we were going to take the day off from Memorial Day, I was like, well, then if we're going to do it, then I think we should tackle ecumenism. And what ecumenism is, and like what are some of the pitfalls of ecumenism what it looks like kind of like maybe even you know some recent examples of ecumenism we could kind of dive a little bit into all that stuff um but i wanted to ask father right off the bat because he's going to do a better job than i did because again i did some pre-pro today so there's a little bit of knowledge i have about this and like from my limited experience with ecumenism and what I've learned from hearing people talk and reading people and stuff like that, reading saints, reading holy people, what they say about ecumenism, and actually based off of some of the comments that we got from our episode last week, it seemed like it was a time to kind of address like what, what it is and why it could be appealing, but also like why it could also be problematic. So Father, if you wouldn't mind giving like a basic rundown of what like ecumenism is and you know what if someone is being like called an ecumenist or if they're claiming to be ecumenist what that means mm, well it's like it's like so many things uh not just now but when you're talking about like orthodoxy in particular in this context of being in the West and people being converts and all that stuff, you know, there's there's the the phrase and the term in a clinical sense, and then there's the the kind of like the phrase and the term like de facto, um, and the two things aren't necessarily the same, although there's overlap. So. Um, <sighs> Ecumenism is, um, I, I want, you know, maybe this is where you're, I don't know what pre-production you did, but I don't know, like, I, I can't say what, what time period we're looking at when it becomes really, um, you know, a force to reckon with. Um, it seemed like it was the 20th century mainly is when things started to get kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because really you don't, you don't, you don't find it. Um, it's not an issue that, <laughs> that ancient people, you know, um, brought up, but essentially ecumenism is this teaching idea that um, on the one hand, someone would say it is the, the desire um, and the belief that there are um, commonalities to be found amongst various traditions um, and that those commonalities um, should not simply be um, brought forth and emphasized, but they, they, but they can be the means by which um, union between various traditions um, is, is possible. Now, there's a localized ecumenism. What I mean by that is like within a kind of Christian tradition, Christian branches, quote unquote, but then there's also another kind of ecumenism, which is broader, which is speaking about just interfaith. So Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, everything like finding commonality and, and, and seeking to, to unite. Um, 
so I don't know. I don't know. Unite meaning like have services together, like like not necessarily like, um, like yeah, become yeah. like yeah, you know. yeah. So it, it it's it's tough because um, both hand like for some people it, it's I guess I guess for everyone there's this bigger hope. I mean, the only reason why anyone would even engage in any type of ecumenical thought, dialogue, practice, whatever, is that there is a hope and a desire that people would find some sort of commonality and that they would find unity. I mean, I don't have a better word for it right now in, 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 in the light of quote unquote God, whatever that means, right? Um, of course, when we're speaking about ecumenism, um, within a Christian tradition, it's a very different conversation than if we're talking about with, you know, interfaith. So, um, so yeah, you guys are going to have to kind of like help narrow because we can go, and in particular, you know, we and I can go either way on this right now because um, both are a problem. Both have their you know, good points, um, or at least they're good intentions, but they're, they're both almost kind of like two distinct animals. And sometimes I think the conversations struggle, conversations around a community like this struggle, if there isn't the proper kind of um, specificity in what you want to look at, because trying to talk about dialogue between Jews and Orthodox Christians is very different than talking about, you know, Methodists and Orthodox, you know, um, very different, right? So sure. it's like, you know, kind of like which ones do you, should we do you I think, tackle well, first? I'll, I'll, I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. Why, why don't we, because this is what's coming to my mind. If we could, if you guys are cool with this, maybe we can zoom like all the way out mm -hmm. to like, a logical progression of like, okay, let's say that this ecumenist um, project was successful. Like, because ultimately, like if somebody is doing this, if that's what they want to do, I'm always somebody who's about like, let's look at the logical progression of this. Like, where are we going to? You say it's you want to do this like now, but- The ecumenist agenda was achieved? Is yes, that what you mean? If, okay. Yes. If it's fully achieved, what I see is one world religion. That's basically what we're talking about, right? It's like a removal of ultimate distinction and being like, hey, there's one world religion, one God, and then somehow all of the faiths that have ever come about all fit in. And in some ways, they're like denominations of a one world religion. Like, is would that be... So I guess my first question is, would that be... Is, is that what would be the logical progression. And then the second question is, what would be wrong with that? Because I think that that's what a lot of people who are not Orthodox, especially would be like, okay, that sounds great, right? right? Like that sounds like a wonderful thing. So I think maybe that's a good place to start. And then we could, cause then it kind of gives us a overarching principle and then we could like drill down into it. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> um, so answering like why it, it's like what's what's the, like what's the problem with it and answering like the big picture I, I think you're correct in the sense that um, it is in the desire of it is ultimately to move towards a one world religion um, and I think you know we have to kind of understand why for you know orthodox and specifically it's problematic because um i don't know um i i, I don't know for sure but definitely because the reason what i'm saying i don't know i couldn't speak for muslims like i don't know enough about islam to say whether but you know just to see to really kind of compare but it seems to me out of out of a little bit I know of Islam, it seems like 
that's probably like one of the few things we have in common is that uh, there's there's a real view of kind of like there's there's an exclusiveness that's there. You know, we approach it very differently. Differently, obviously. Um, but all that being said, um, yeah, that's that's a definite problem for us. And the reason why that's a problem for us is because um, orthodoxy is fundamentally the the body of Jesus Christ, the God man, the second person of the Holy Trinity who established his church um, historically in the world. And we believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified, I mean, that's why I'm going through the creed, right? We believe that he is God. We know that he is God. We experience him as God. Um, and so because we know, and so here's here's where it starts coming in. Other people are like, well, we believe he's God too, right? Like all these, like this is where we start getting kind of money. People say, well, we believe he's God too, but we will say like, okay, yes. However, when we begin to understand not simply him as God, but also too, how do we experience and participate and really, um, you know, live out this belief that he is God. Well, for us, that is like the creed and our traditions and, uh, you know, first and foremost, our Eucharistic um, practice and experience. And, you know, that Eucharistic experience is uh, exclusive. It's, it's closed. And why is it closed? Um, why is it that, um, you know, the Eucharist for the Orthodox is only for the Orthodox. You know, you can't, unlike other Christian confessions, you can't, you know, just, no one can just kind of come in and take communion. Well, it's for the same reason, no one can just kind of come into my bedroom and sleep with my wife. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple, right? Um, we can get way more complex than that, but I think just trying to zoom out, trying to keep a zoomed out lens, we'll start with that. So I think that that's the first thing to understand is, not so much of, you know, our, our stance on ecumenism has really nothing to do with what other people believe. It has everything to do with what we believe and what we know. If, if you understand the distinction I'm making there, right? Um, so because we know, believe and experience everything that I just kind of laid out, that also means that um, we hold absolutely you know, well, we're supposed to at least unfailingly um, the teachings of our Lord in regards of, you know, eschatology, like the world, um, what, like, what, what is the world? Like, like, this is one of the things that I think a lot of people, especially if they're coming from a non-Catholic, you know, small C, small C uh, context is that the faith is the ground, the church is the ground and pillar of, of truth, as St. Paul says in Timothy. And so what that means is, you know, the church doesn't tell you how to eat soup, but it, it will tell you like when, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, you know, it, it's, it's the, the church is, is, is our lodestone for to how, like of what reality is, who, who is reality how, and how do we engage reality? And so, that becomes a way more personal and way more um, tangible than some people realize, right? Um, the church will speak to you about, you know, sexual practice. It'll t talk to you about your diet. It will speak to you about all kinds of things, right? Um, and the reason for that is because the church is is the people of God, and God has created this world um, and there's a design to this world. And although God is not a tyrant and although God, you know, to the detriment of, <laughs> to, to, to the seemingly, uh, the detriment of, of, of people, you know, God honors free will. And so with that being said, God also provides us a means by which our free will um, can be harnessed 
and used in such a way to bring life and not and not um, death and destruction. So how, what does that do with ecumenism? Well, um, there's all kinds of different perspectives on what reality is and how and how to engage reality, and including other traditions, other faiths, and including other confessions. And they they simply do not line up um, with the truth as it's been revealed to us. Let me give you an example. What is the nature of death? Well, if you're outside the Orthodox confession and you're a Christian, um, first of all, if you're outside the Catholic confession, let, let, we can even like make it even broader, right? If you think that there's, there's no communion between us and the quote unquote saints, we have a fundamental disagreement on, on the nature of reality and the nature of death and, and the nature of who God is and what God did, right? So that alone begins to speak to why ecumenism is a problem, right? We, don't, we almost don't even have to get into, which I, I'm, you know, I'd love to get into it, right? I'd love to get into talking about the antichrist and one world religion, that's great because um, it makes good TV, but <laughs> to make it like, make it real, make it real simple, just that alone we can talk about. We, we don't even need to get anything into anything, you know, kind of like quote unquote sensational or like, you know, spicy because just the fact that someone says, no, you can't, pray, they're dead. Well, if you're a Christian and you think those people are dead and there's no connection there, I, I would say to you, and this is, I'll say it, you know, cause this will make good TV too. Um, we have different gods. Amen. It's a different religion. It's not the yeah, same We have religion a different sure. religion. We have different gods. Um, and, you know, there's overlap and everything too, but, you know, Jesus was asking the apostles, well, who do you say I am? Who do men say I am? And, and that's, that's fundamentally the question about orthodoxy. You know, it's like, I was talking to, um, I was talking to um, uh, one of the catechumens, um, Andrew's uh, brother, and uh, we're talking stuff and he's, I mean, you know, I hope he doesn't, you know, get mad at me for saying this, but he's, I really like him. He's a really deep and, and good, like genuinely good hearted guy. You know what I mean? Amen. Um, but like talking with him is difficult to some degree because it's like, well, I'm trying to suss out, you know, uh, how I can help him in his, in his catechumenate. But it was like, duh. I was like, who's Jesus Christ to you? You know what I mean? It's like, that's, that's the key. You know what I mean? It always needs to come back to, and, and it's a temptation, right? Like I'm confessing right now, like it's a temptation because orthodoxy is so great. And there's just, we could spend forever learning everything, but at the end of the day, it's about who is Jesus Christ, right? So that is like the kind of like big thousand foot answer, I guess, is like, that's why ecumenism doesn't work fundamentally because. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna get in here real quick. Um, so I'm, I'm really sorry. This is the way that it's always kind of worked for me. So this is the mountain of the royal path. Father's up at the top. He kind of hands the information down to Cyprian. And then I'm like hanging out at the bottom, kind of like <laughs> giving letters to people, trying to like make it. So the way that's always worked for me, and it kind of came to me and it stuck kind of the test of time. And I'm really sorry, but this is the way it works for me. But it is, it's just like the, it's like the city of Cleveland. The city of Cleveland has a nature. Like you can't come along and say the city of Cleveland has a population of 4 million people. Like you can't do that because it's like, that's fundamentally not true. You're like, Oh, you know, the city of Cleveland is in Southern California. It's like, well, we believe the city of Cleveland is in Southern California. It's like, well, that's fundamentally not true. Mm -hmm. The problem is the city of Cleveland has revealed itself. It has a nature. It has a set population. It has these buildings as these roads to come along and say, oh, you know, the home team for Cleveland is the Gators, you know, or something like that. It's like, no, it's not. That doesn't, that's not true. And so I'm sorry, that's me, Pat. That's at me at the bottom of the mountain kind of saying like, this is the way I've always kind of seen it. It's like, there is a nature, there is a truth. 
and it's not just left up to inter- in, like interpretation. Yeah, but being, see like, that. But see, which I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the fundamental problems with ecumenism, in regards of it's like we need to find a code word for tonight, like one or two, talking about inter interconfession, meaning like Christian ecumenism, and then like ecumenism within other faiths because there's overlap, but there's points where we want to like zoom in, right? You're like a could it be like a capital E, small E? No, because we, because that actually we can use for something else too, right? But I would say this. Here's one of the big problems which, with like Christian ecumenism, right? Is that there's a there's like a fundamental disagreement. And that is, is Jesus historically real or not? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because Protestants, it, Protestants, evangelicals you know they would say they're all about it the jesus project all that stuff but the fact of the matter is is de facto everything's subjective everything's subjective however you want to interpret the bible like all that stuff is subjective right yeah so therefore again forgive me for using the word three times so far already but de facto you're already demonstrating that you don't have a concrete objective experience and understanding of who Christ is. Do you, do you, do you see where I'm going with that? That's because, such a big point, Father. Yeah. Like that's so, like that really, yes. Because if you had, because if Jesus Christ is a historical figure, history happened mm-hmm. and there's a record of it that mm-hmm. is the most accurate, there is one most accurate record Mm -hmm. just like in all the things in our life it's like this either happened or it didn't happen and Mm -hmm. if it did happen and you truly believe that it did how could you accept all all kinds of subjective interpretations you just simply couldn't i mean and and you and you wouldn't like if you're an evangelical like best intentions and let's just give the piece the psa real quick um I know people get offended and it's whatever. None of this, like the, none of this is necessarily about individuals. We're talking about systems, right? Because there's people, you know, shout out to Frank and everybody. Like there's people who aren't Orthodox who, who watch the show and I, I'm, I'm glad and I don't want to unduly offend, right? I'm just covering that base, right? So let's just be clear, right? We're talking about systems and practices and not necessarily individuals okay but we, we'll get into that too though I'm, I'm fine because that's an aspect of ecumenism we can get into um if there was ever going to be a three-hour show it might be this one so anyways <laughs> like um but the fact of the matter is is you know let's just let's say that let's play let's role play right and like you know your name's john and you're you're a staunch evangelical and you're like you know, you orthodox, blah, blah, blah. You don't hold to the Bible, traditions of man, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And then I'm looking at you and I go, okay, so let me get, understand this, Ralph. You're like, huh? No, 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 my name is John. Okay, Ralph. So, you know what I mean? Like, we can play this game all day long. And you're like, no, my name's John. I'm like, no, okay, Ralph. Like, so how long have you been, you know, dyeing your hair purple? What do you mean I'm bald? No, you got, you know, you know what I'm saying? That sounds absurd. But that's basically the logical endpoint. That's the logical conclusion of, of this disposition, this perspective, if that makes sense, right? And that's why, ding, 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 chicken wing, like we've all converted because at some point in time, we've had some sort of understanding that, like, oh, okay, God is real. <laughs> and since God is real and God has, you know, you know affected the world right that that the effect is tangible it isn't just you know it isn't just my woo-woo feelings right and I, I think that's something else that a lot of people who struggle with orthodox you know because there's this accusation which aren't you know there's validity to it unfortunately we can all become arrogant but you'll find this experience where people they just automatically think, oh, you guys are so arrogant. You think like, well, the claims to, to the one true church on stuff, but they don't understand what that means. And they don't understand what we mean by that. And it's, it has nothing to do with like, you know, you're not in the club. It's just like, you know, is your name John or Ralph? 
Are you, you know what I mean? Are you a man or a woman? Exactly. Are you, you, you see what I'm saying? It's, exactly. it's, it's literally objective fact, right? Um, and now to be fair, is that enough? No, it's not enough because Zoroasterism is very old as well. Like it's not just, it's not just a matter of like how old something is, but it's the totality of everything because that experience of Christ coming and, and turning your life upside down, penetrating your heart, how, however it was for you, what allows you to follow the rabbit down the hole is this kind of concrete reality. And I think that's something that we all share as well. Not all of us came to the church because we were, you know, researching history or this or that, but all of us will say without a doubt, the history of the church definitely helped us to like jump that precipice, right? Because you're like, this is this is just a fact. You know what I mean? Like you can you can open up the encyclopedia before the internet and see it. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. it's it's mm -hmm. it's not up for debate. So all that being said, that's one of the problems just right from jump in regards of ecumenism is that um, it it really operates from at least you know I would say from my perspective and, and from our perspective in a general sense a fairly disingenuous presupposition right that all things you know all views of who Christ is and all views of who God is are are equal or or not equal let's say accurate right and therefore yes and therefore equal since they're all accurate to some degree and we would say fundamentally that's false it's fundamentally false you know well the underlying presupposition is that oh it's really it's really actually kind of gross it's making my like now now i see kind of the sinister aspect of it because the underlying presupposition is it's all just a made-up story to make mm -hmm. you feel better mm -hmm. the yeah, underlying guys. presupposition of that must be that it can because the second that you say no i've actually had an experience and it's an experience mm -hmm. that Look, I'm somebody who's all about probabilities. I work in the world of cryptocurrency. It's like, it's all about the tech, the technical side is all about probabilities. I've had some things happen in my life that are like, since, since orthodoxy, since coming into the orbit of orthodoxy, I've had some things happen in my life that are multiple things mm -hmm. that even one of them is so unlikely, but the multiples of them and the way that they right. happen to where I'm like, there's no, there's no way, right. there's no way like right. there's there's an objective experience that's happening here and this should not be happening this actually can't be happening that's actually the feeling that i've had is like this can't be happening and and it's like that is not made up and it, the thing is that as i talk to to especially orthodox converts it's like every single person i talk to has several of these experiences right. and i'm like what here I am for in my forties. And it's like, I've, I can't recall experiences that I've had like that. And maybe there were small ones and I wasn't, I didn't have the eyes to see or ears to hear, but it's like, maybe there were, I was being called at various times, but it's that it's in order for me to believe that all of these other, let's say faiths, traditions, whatever are accurate. Like I, I would have to say that their interpretation of the world is it has that objective nature to it. And it's just time and time again, as I've looked at these things, it doesn't. Like, yeah. and the things that I practice, it doesn't have that. It doesn't. And, and I, I think this is one of the problems too, is that um, like the, one of the real tragedies of ecumenical thought is that it, it really does an injustice to everyone around, like everyone involved. Because what it does is it, it, it boils down whoever's involved into a caricature so you're never really dealing with orthodoxy you're dealing with a caricature of orthodoxy you're never really dealing with like let's say catholicism you're dealing with a caricature of catholicism because you have to do that in order to try to make it fit right if you if you take those traditions as they actually exist and are it's very you'll find very quickly that they're not compatible right and they're not compatible not because of you know personal taste or whatever right they're not compatible because of who Christ is and what Christ has revealed. So this gets even more um, 
shall we say, obvious when you move into like interfaith ecumenism, yeah. obviously. Um, but even then people try it, you know, it's like, the, it's, it's shocking how many people, depending on where you're at, you know, um, certain communities, certain ethnic communities, certain, you know, churches, they'll struggle with, they'll struggle with other interfaith uh, ecumenical dialogues more than others, you know, like obviously churches that are in the Near East, they struggle with um, a type of acquiescing to Islam because of political reasons and, and all that, that, you know, other, other churches and communities like have no problem, you know what I mean? Um, but the fact of the matter is there's plenty of people who are like, oh, you know, the, we've all heard this, right? They're all religions of the book, right? God of Abraham. God, God of Abraham, Abraham, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, ah, <laughs> no, because, you know, like I said, um, I don't know much about Islam, but I know more than the guy on the street who's not a Muslim, you know what I mean? And I'll tell you, they're not, you know, we, we don't have the same God, you know what I mean? Same thing with Judaism, don't have the same God, sorry, you know? Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, things that are in common, of course, you know, because Islam is basically a, uh, you know, a, a Christian heresy, you know what I mean? Um, it, it's just, I mean, uh, Muhammad's, you know, uncle was like an historian priest, you know, it's like, and, and you look at Islam, it's like, there's so much there that's stolen from, from orthodoxy, you know? Um, and then we can get on, you know, I, I don't know if we need, I don't know if we want to zoom in now and just talk about specifically, if we want to maybe put a period on the, the bigger zoom. Yeah. Um, maybe we want to touch a couple more points on, on why it's problematic. Um, I, I, think I, I think I'd like to say one other thing too, just real quick in regards of um, interconfessional ecumenism. And that is, uh, you know, there's, um, I, you know, let, just for the sake of, you know, kind of good TV, whatever, like, um, I, I see, in some regard, I would consider myself, um, ecu you know, I'm definitely ecumenical, but I'm not an ecumenist, if that makes sense, right? So um, I recognize that God is working with all people. You know, God is working with the Jew, with the Muslim, with the Satanist, with the atheist. God's, God's working with everyone. And God loves everybody. You know, God loves the child molester. God loves the murderer. God loves them all, right? Um, but at the same token, are we going to say that God, you know, because when people talk talk in this type of language that God loves everybody, there is this inference that God condones things as well. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? And it's like, well, who are we talking about? Then we're talking about God, right? So I, I absolutely affirm and believe with every five of my being that God loves everyone. But, you know, you can watch, I don't know how many episodes we have, but pretty much every episode we've done, at some point in time, we're talking about the love of God is not like the love that people think in regards of, you know, gushy feelings and do whatever you want. So, you know, with that being said, um, it really comes down to a matter of like, well, who like, well, like what God are you talking about? You know what I mean? And, and what do you mean by, by love? Right. Because when I say God loves everyone, you know, it's like, yeah, that's great. That's great. Everyone's on board, you know, kumbaya. But I, I, I've done this before. And then I'll start saying like, yeah, God loves the child molester too. And people go like, eh, yeah, yeah. Like, like they become a little squeamish. They don't really want to acknowledge that. You know what I mean? Um, and, I, and I'm talking about people on the far left of the spectrum who are like, you know, let it all hang out. God doesn't care. And I'm like, okay, well, child molesters, right? And they, just, you know, so what's the point of that? The point is, is that they have a God of their own making. They, they have a God of their own making and, and they want to basically find a way to validate whatever appetite that they have, whatever disposition that they have. And that's just, that's just not the case. So I'm saying all this because the ecumenical issue is 
really not so much about God. It's really more about like us, you know what I mean? And, and our desire to, it's, it's, it's like a tower of Babel, really, you know, it's, it's really people trying to build this tower to God and saying like, we're, we're going to build a tower and make you come down and, and, and do what we want, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's another thing about orthodoxy, like, fundamentally orthodoxy like is, is antithetical to that it, it's in the very fiber of our practice and our in our belief you know well it also seems like the ascetic and monastic practices that have remained it seems like most it seems like they've remained in orthodoxy but it seems like they're exactly I, when i say seems like they've remained like in terms of of all of the people who would call themselves christian like, yes, I know that in the Roman Roman Catholicism, there is like a degree of monasticism and I guess asceticism, but it's not, I mean, it's not pushed to the forefront in the same way that it is in orthodoxy. And it just seems like when you have holy individuals for thousands of years and their practice basically entails a level of solitude in search of an objective truth, that seems to be the exact opposite of let me combine all of these disparate people and try to find a way to make them work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Those two things seem like mutually exclusive. Yeah, I mean, they are by nature because there has to be a truth. That's and right. Like that, that has to be, there has to be like, it, I mean, I don't know. It, that's one of the problems with, <clears throat> in my opinion, I mean, that's one of the problems with like, Oh, I don't know. I'm getting kind of like sick of picking on them a little bit, but one of the problems with the wokes a little bit, you know, like is it really hit me the other day. And I'm sure that this is an old revelation for you guys. And I'm okay with that, but it really just hit me. It's just like, man, it's just nihilism. It just, it, there's no fundamental truth behind anything. I mean, truth is whatever you want it to be. And even then, like you put as much in, like suddenly it was one of those moments of like all these things started to click into place. And then father talked about a little bit about and i've seen this with uh the people i've talked to who tend to be a little bit more ecumenist than me certainly um if anything i probably take too hard of a stance on it some like sometimes but um i i've talked with people and father mentioned that like there's this like level of wanting to keep up with the world of like wanting to like stay with the world. And when I have talked to the people I've talked to, it seems like there's just a little bit of, well, I don't really want to say the things that would be necessary to say. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't really want to say the things because, you know, we've all been more or less brainwashed, you know, blah, 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 to kind of think like the person who stands up and says like, no, there is a God and he's not one, he's not like condoning your behavior. And two, he's not whatever you wanted to be. And three, there is one right path, you know, more or less like the path is narrow and you need God's help to get there, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's not like is it to say that something like that is like, you know, it's it's terribly unpopular. And so to like and I know that from personal experience and like actually saying taking that stance of like, look, I don't know what to tell you, man. I mean, like you know, life would like reality be fundamentally different if this were not the case, but it is the case. And like the, th and like you taking the stance that you're taking, it kind of just leads me to this idea that like you're dabbling in not necessarily like because you're a nihilist, but you're dabbling in nihilist because nihilism is like the, it's like in the air, you know, and like yeah. saying something like that, it's just not conducive anymore. Yeah. I mean, I like going back to the creed, right? One, one, singular, holy, um, set apart, holy meaning sanctified, holy meaning other, right? Set apart, like, like sanctified means only for this purpose, this person, right? Catholic, um, yes, universal, right? But also meaning whole, um, W-H-O-L-E, complete. Apostolic, meaning sent, Right, so sent means that there's a theology there. There's a purpose. There's a design. There. Like, like there's a re like apostolic means to be sent with mission, intent. Right, to be sent by someone. Church, ecclesia, body. Right. Um, this, uh, like this whole moniker, in of itself tells you something. Right. Um, 
it, it speaks to this beautiful paradox of unity that is, you know, you know, that is exclusive, absolutely, an exclusiveness that's universal, right? One, singular, holy, set apart, but, ap you know, um, Catholic, universal and whole, like together, but also universal. And, and this, is, this is why I bring this up because we, we so like, man, um, someone could really say we, as Orthodox in particular, kind of hoeing in, we're meanies and, and even someone might be tripping on us because we're like doing almost two shows back to back on ecumenism, but it just kind of rolls out this way. Um, it's not intentional. But I, I think the thing I want to get at is this is like the truth. Orthodoxy is the revelation of the God man to humanity, period. And it's one of the reasons why our parish is where it's at, you know, because I believe with every fire of my being, if orthodoxy isn't for the person in the hood, quote unquote, then it's not for anybody, right? Because it, it, it's, it's, it's universal, right? Because it speaks to man, right? Mankind. And it's, the, it's the, the path and the arc of salvation for all of mankind, right? Now, it, does that mean every individual? Abs actually, no, <laughs> right? Like, like, yes, every individual would find their home and their completion in the church, but the fact of the matter is, is, is it for, is it for every individual? Yes. Will every individual join? No. That that's, that's, that's the rub, right? So I'm ecumenical in the sense of, you know, that this is, this gets us into some of the actual problems too, with some of the uh, more uh, kind of liberal leaning quote unquote orthodox people is that, I mean, they just, you know, and I understand it, I, I understand it, but it's certain things are just twisted in the sense that when you begin to go down a road of ecumenical disposition and thought, because you think that it's, it, it speaks of a more kind of Christian charity, you, you're actually betraying Christian love mm -hmm. because, because Christian love, right? Um, Christian love is like, yes, um, when Jesus stands with the woman and says, hey, you know, the woman caught in adultery, the Pharisees want to stone her, right? And Christ says, you know, he, you know, writes their sins down according to St. Nikolai, Vavimovich. you know, it's like, he writes all the sins down to the Pharisees of what they're guilty of, they read it, and they're like, oh, okay, they drop their stones, right? And then he says, like, does anyone here accuse you, right? Okay, so she's like, no, well, Jesus doesn't stone her, but what does he say to her? Go and sin no more. Yeah. That see that that's Christian love. Christian love, and that's where the that's where so many of the more liberal types they see it just as Jesus standing with the woman who's caught in adultery and standing in solidarity with her. And full stop, that's it. I'm like, nope, that's not it, right? Because you also need the portion where Jesus says, Go and sin no more. That's Christian love, which is the totality of both the world path. Otherwise, you're otherwise you're an enabler. Otherwise, you're an enabler. Yeah. So can I ask something really quick? The the vibe of a love, right? The so what? the vibe? The, the vibe. Okay. So I'm going somewhere with this. So just mm -hmm. give me one second. And this may be nothing. Anyway, I just have to like cough and awkwardly move on. But let's let's go there for just one second. So the vibe of a love. So I know that in my time in the social work that I do, that there's that there's different types of love that you can tell people. And there's even times where I probably even spilled out a little bit more on the tough love than I probably should have. But I know that there that the people I work with at a certain point, I am very, very willing and able to just be like, no, that like a lot of them. So the issue that's coming to mind is, is like, um, is like somebody's like, well, I'm afraid my past is going to catch up with me. And, the, and they're like, isn't that so silly? And I'm like, I'm afraid that some of the stuff that I did that's really wrong in the past is going to end up coming back and biting me in the butt. And I'm like, well, the fact of the matter is, is it might like and like my dear little 
Raj, Rajnikov, is that his name from Crime and Punishment? Crime, like Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov. Little Raskolnikov, you might need your seven years in prison to feel better. Like it's not a big deal. Like you're in a fever right now because you feel guilt. And like there's nothing wrong with that. Like feeling bad for the things you've done is part of healing, like admitting that shame letting it out now there's a difference between that type of love and then the love that sometimes they do get which is oh honey it's fine god forgives everyone forgives it's all good don't worry about it it's never going to come back and get you like don't worry about it that has a whole different type of feeling to it and the feeling that i've been getting over the last couple years only that i've woken up really to is this less like you're beautiful no matter what no matter what anybody says like you you can do it like even if you only got out of the house and walked around the block two times, honey, that's a victory. Good for you. Like that has a whole different vibe to it. And like, that's gone pathological at this point now. So that's what I'm saying. That's kind of like this whole thing of like, so forgive me recently, there's these Apple watch commercials where it's like this dude who's flipping out. It shows like your body is trying to talk to you. Like, I don't know, have you guys seen these? I haven't seen it. Okay, so it's like your body's trying to talk to you. So it shows this one guy, and he's on his phone, he's all freaking out. And he's like going like this, and he's on his phone. There's another one sitting next to him. He's like, hey. And they start doing like yoga poses because his WAP watch is telling him to breathe and stuff like that. Breathe and be calm and like feel your inner power and feel your you and stuff like that. Oh, no, I mean, I'm straight up. It's like hbo max has the worst commercials if i can just say that really quick the most like nope we're on board with the ac agenda we are right here like we are right on board so all that being said so there's this vibe to this love and so i think that's one of the emotional differences i have felt between ecumenism and like i mean i guess are they opposite ends of the spectrum ecumenism versus orthodoxy i don't know but what I'm saying is, is like in this particular, well, it, it, it would have, it would have to be right. Because orthodoxy would mean that there's one way. So like the opposite Ortho of orthodoxy means would correct. Be, yeah, right. correct. Right. One correct way. Heterodoxy would mean, mean that, wrong. That, that like what I'm saying is, is maybe. In no, but heter, hetero, heterodox, heterodox. So ecu ecumenism oh, would yeah, combine yeah. all heterodoxies. You're right. Right. So it would be the opposite. The opposite of orthodoxy is heterodoxy. So in this sense, because I haven't really had time to think it out, and I know someone's probably going to call me out on it. So in this sense, I will say yes. So you have these two different vibes to these two loves and on an emotional level. And that's the one I'm most comfortable speaking on. On an emotional like slash, like how are you feeling about this type of level? I can say that that type of heterodoxic ecumenist love that the commercials from HBO Max are talking about and then you have your love that I'm talking about where like, you know, St. Porphyrios is telling a woman like your son doesn't like you. And frankly, I don't like I've been in a room with you for half an hour and I kind of want to give you a smack like, you know, those aren't that I'm paraphrasing here, but like the two different types of love. So that ethos. Well, one isn't love. That's the point. I was I was just that's, about like, like one is in love and 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 orthodoxy. That, that's the, the biggest problem. That, that I run into as a pastor, right? Um, the biggest problem really for a lot of people is, you know, um, emotions and emotionalism. And most people, and I'm not, you know, I'm not being hyperbolic, most people, right, conflate love with emotions. That That's fundamentally the problem. Yes. Emotions have nothing to do with it. And, and what I mean by nothing to do with it what I mean is like, if, if any man who's been married for more than 10 years and has a child over the age of like two years old knows that emotions have nothing to do with it. Because there's so many times when if it did, you'd be in jail for murder, right? <laughs> like, like emotions have nothing to do with it. Love is, and, and that's like the whole point is that those things aren't love what the world presents, which is including ecumenism presents as love is not love, actually. It's something in the place of actual love. That's like the point I was getting at with the, the woman caught in adultery and Christ's response to her because the 
truth, right? There can be emotions in there, but emotions are there to serve to serve a bigger picture, right? They they help you flesh out what you're experiencing, right? That that's that that's the purpose of emotions. And so that that vibe and, and all that stuff that you're talking about, like it is the problem. And there is like, and it is the problem in regards of where some people they get twisted up and they have a wrong disposition, even if they're quote unquote orthodox, right? And there's then there's lots of them, right? And it comes from a conflating of what love is, and it also comes from like lacking ethos and dogma, because let's 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 dive into a little bit of like like churchy stuff right so like like if you want to talk about you know let, let's take saint nikolai veromovich and saint Eustin popovich right two serbian bishops two saints who have kind of really two seemingly disparate approaches to ecumenism right but they both you know they both end up in the same place. Why? Right. So St. Nikolai has this great book um, called The Agony of the Church. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's him addressing um, the Anglican Church um, in the interim years of like the first, you know, um, the first and second world war, whatever, or beginning of the second war, second world war, forgive me. So, you know, someone can, uh, someone could ignorantly read a lot of St. Nikolai because St. Nikolai, you know, he'll have some very interesting and charitable things to say about other faiths, like Hinduism. He'll talk about the loftiness of, of, of the Hindu mind and all this stuff, right? But is St. Nikolai an ecumenist in the sense of he thinks that, you know, they're all like, they're all God? No, right? Why? Why can we say that? Because, well, first of all, there's a thing called context. And the other thing is there's a thing called, you know, true evangelical spirit. Like St. Nikolai as a bishop understands the absolute need. And this is where a lot of Orthodox on the other side, on the right side of the path, let's talk about that a little bit, have really lost it because we're so scared of the boogeyman, which rightfully so. After the shenanigans and the, the blasphemy that has happened in the last two years, especially in 2020, Everyone's up in arms and everyone has their radar on, which they should, and I'm one of them too. But at the same token, we can't allow the devil using unfortunate, you know, situations with, with hierarchs and things like that and 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 um, profaning, you know, the holy tradition of the church. We can't use that as a means by which we lose another aspect of our mission, which is to bring the light of the gospel. Right. So this is what I mean by being ecumenical, but I'm not an ecumenist. Right. I, I'm all about making bridges. Right. I want to make a bridge with the Pentecostal. I want to make a bridge with, you know, um, you know, the, the neo-pagan, especially, you know, I want to make a bridge with the atheist. I want to make a bridge with everyone. Right. Because Christ is the light of the world. It's a bridge right? where they head in to orthodoxy right bridge where they head in not like going out right and so like the thing is is so in that sense saint nikolai does bring up some really profound connections right and and I will, I'll, I'll give you an example right every tradition that has authentically sought god right with authentically like honestly right any person who has authentically sought god like they will find their fulfillment in orthodoxy Right. This is St. Herman of Alaska with the, with the Inuits. Right. I assume the Aleuts like looking at their tradition, their indigenous practices and seeing where Christ can can be revealed, you know, um, and they're very orthodox now. Some of those yeah, communities. Right. Yeah. 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 Have, you seen that, have you guys seen that trailer for like Sacred that trailer, Alaska? Yeah. That's wonderful. Oh, that's yeah. Wonderful. It's wonderful. So like so in that sense, you know, definitely ecumenical like. I just, I just got to go there, right? I mean, I'm just going to go. Who cares, right? I'm just going to go there. So I think right now, especially for um, Roman Catholics, um, you know, there, there's an increasing grow and pull to the pull 
to the church, right? To orthodoxy. Why? Well, there's some pretty obvious reasons why. I mean, you know, it's like I was saying before, you know, Mother Mother Elizabeth, uh, the, the, the senior nun here, she's like, you know, she'll say, I became Orthodox to be become, you know, a better Catholic, right? And so those, those good, well-meaning Catholics, shout out to Frank, you know, who love the Lord and love tradition, um, you know, the reason why they, they even care about Orthodoxy is because, unfortunately, Rome has left and is increasingly showing less and less of a care for the traditions and the truth of, of the apostolic church that that's just i think that's a, i feel like that's a fact right because you got guys like taylor marshall and these you know rad trad guides and like you know they're putting up icons or this and that and it's just like i get it god bless them you know like and god bless them for not wanting to leave their their tradition willy-nilly but like you know, if what I was saying wasn't true, then these guys wouldn't have the audiences that they do. Why do they have the audiences they do? Because there's so many Catholics who are just heartbroken because the Roman Catholic Church is, is, is in really bad shape, <laughs> right? On, on some really fundamental levels, right? Um, That's the organization, not necessarily the individual that that's 100% organization. And so like all good pious Catholics who love the mother of God, who love the Trinity, who love the saints, you know, uh, God bless them. You know, like, like uh, for me, that's a point of, 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 of real ecumenical dialogue, but the dialogue there isn't like, Hey, where do we find our similarities? The dialogue should be like, what's the truth? Let's get on that because the truth is the only thing that's going to save us in this fallen, broken world, which, by the way, is becoming increasingly hostile to the truth. Now, let me just say this, because I was talking about that. Well, and earlier. Father, forgive me, because I don't want to, on the truth note, I don't want that to, it to go by that, like, and Rome recognizes orthodoxy as the true church or as a true church, uh -huh. like in their own canons, it's uh -huh. it, that it is a true church. So it's like, it, I yeah. think that's notable. It is that's notable. no that's very notable that it's like Rome itself is like, oh yeah, this is a true church. Sacraments totally valid, yeah. like everything. Yeah. yeah. It is notable. You know, and again, we're we're talking about organization, not the not the organism of the people. You know what I mean? But uh, you know, just to get a little bit in there, right? Let's just be really frank about something. Um when you look to see, we don't even have to get into like Vatican II, right? Cause like, we, we, let's talk about what's happened in the last five years. Let's, let's talk about what's happened in the last three years, right? Um, for as bad as things have been um, in orthodoxy, we look and we go like, no one's saying orthodoxy is the problem. We're all saying it's the it's the hierarchs, right? But no one's saying orthodox is the problem. Everyone's like, man, the hierarchs. And, and what, what is the problem? Well, we're saying these hierarchs are ecumenists. These hierarchs, you know, that the problem is the hierarchs are drinking the world's Kool-Aid, right? But no one's saying, well, orthodox is corrupted. We're saying, no, it's the hierarchs, right? It's a little different in Rome, right? Because, because Someone goes, well, it's the Pope, this and that, but it's like, yeah, but you know, it goes even a little bit further than that, right? You know that deep down inside, there's, there's, there's a fundamental corruption there, right? And that corruption isn't just, I don't mean necessarily in like the Godfather sense of it, like it, of intrigue. I'm talking more about what we were talking about last week, right? The, the, real, the real issues that we have to be honest about because to not be honest about them is, is doing a disservice to both Rome and the East, right? We have to be honest about like what is going on there. And I would, I would just end on this point. When we really talk about the problem of ecumenism within Christian confessions, right? All the stuff that we've said that that's all fine and dandy. That's all one thing. But but here here's the big issue, right? And this is what I've tried to share with people who are in mixed marriages, right? 
just for the record, everyone, when we talk about mixed marriages orthodox, what we talk about, we're talking about people who are, you know, it like one's orthodox, one's not. That's the only real mixed marriage, right? It has nothing to do with ethnicity or whatever, but it's, it's someone's orthodox, one isn't. But the thing I've always said to them is like, look, you know, because this is what we have, like, you know, what, what I have to do is I have to make this person sign an agreement saying you will raise the children orthodox. <laughs> if you're going to marry this person, like we don't like, we don't, the bishop doesn't like granting them, but, you know, a concession we made, but this has to be agreed upon that you will raise the children orthodox. Why is that? Right? Well, I'll tell you why it is, right? Because let me put it this way. It's a lot easier to pull someone down off of a stool than it is to pull them up, right? And so the fact of the matter is, is that there's a real concern in regards of, a man, this sounds tough, but it, it, there's a concern in regards of a corrupting influence, right? That, and the corrupting influence is not, it's not one of morality, right? But it's one of dogma, of ethos, of doctrine, right? And because there has to be a truth. There, there is truth. Yes. There, there is truth, right? And so when you're talking about, you know, the, this, this reality within, you know, intermarriages, getting back to what you were saying earlier, um, you know, I had, a, I, had a, <laughs> I had a Catholic priest years ago, um, great, great guy, you know, but um, we're sitting down uh, having a beer and we were talking and, you know, it's, God bless him, you know, um, he's a better man than I am in every way, I'm sure. But, you know, he was telling me about like, you know, he's basically trying to get me to take communion, you know, and I was like, I, I, I don't, I can't take, he's like, no, 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 you can, blah, blah, blah. I said, no, I don't think you understand. I don't think you understand. Like, yes, you can, you can commune me, but I, I can't and will not take your sacraments, right? I had a question about this. Continue, Father, but please don't, don't, don't just pass to the next thing because I have a big question about. Yeah, this. yeah. So, so that should tell people something, and that's why also too. Um, you know, there's 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 one particular major like hierarchy in another jurisdiction, and God bless all my all my you know God fearing pious brothers and sisters in the, in that jurisdiction. But there's one like their main hierarch who's just talking all kinds of crazy ecumenical nonsense, right? And it's just like it's it's really discouraging because, right? Because it's like, can't you see what's happened to the to to the Catholics? Right? And and these movements, right, as well-meaning as they are, right? The fruit of them. The, the fruit of these movements, there's, it, it isn't good, right? It isn't increasing unto people's piety and faith and strength. It actually, it, it, it moves them away from the kind of Christian zeal that, that's salvific. So anyways. But they might start to feel like a good thing and then might get discouraged away from it. Because I know that that happened to me a lot when I first, it's not the same thing. And I know, Cyprian, you have a question. So I'll make no, this. No, go ahead, please. When I was in AA, like very early starting off, like I would have some notions like what my sponsor is telling me is not good. I don't I don't like it. But he kind of discouraged me from pursuing that. And, I, you know, later on, that was kind of harmful a little bit because I had to let go of some stuff. But, you know, they say, like, don't imagine God while you're praying, like Orthodox say, like, you know, that's not good prayer. And like, um, you know, my sponsor would say, like, oh, imagine what you think God looks like in your mind and pray to that. And it's just like. I don't feel like that that's a good thing. And he's like, you know, what happens when, you know, that person says like, yeah, see, no. that's, that's a great point because there's a lot of things that here's another thing about ecumenism that I think people really miss out on is there's some stuff that in the name of trying to feel good is super dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of practices, contemplative practices, a lot of approaches that we would go like, like, yo, that's, that's dangerous, right? Certain things you just, you don't do if you're Orthodox, right? Because it's dangerous. Like all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial, right? And that, that's a maxim for us. What was your question? Uh, so, so, so my question is about, well, this is all related, like, cause he's bringing up good prayer and bad prayer. 
So here's my question, and I had been meaning to ask you this, and it's the appropriate time because I'm sure this will come up for other people. This idea of uh, are we allowed to, because as you were talking about, uh, you know, taking communion from a Catholic priest, are we allowed to pray? So I guess we're not allowed to pray with heretics, right? No. Okay. What does that mean? What does I understand like not going in the church and attending a service, but like, does that extend to like praying with grandma? No, not, I'm not even talking about that. I'm like talking about if I go to a party here and you know, they're, I mean, they're very Catholic here and they say grace, everyone like, am I allowed to even bow my head to that? Am I allowed to, and they, as they bless the food, you know what I mean? Am I allowed to say, amen? Like to, yeah, what degree yeah. does this go yeah. to? Like, hey, I would like to know. Yeah. This, you know? Father, so, I, I can actually feel this one really quick. It's a great time to answer emails. That's all I'll say, because like I work <laughs> at a Protestant organization and like whenever they bow their head in prayer, it's just like, Oh, you got to get this real quick. So anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Father. Yeah. I, I think there's a couple of things that I, I would kind of say pastorally. The first one is, is that you, you have to take in mind, I mean, it's tough enough for me as it is, but uh, certain things apply differently when you're in a, when you are in a position of authority in, in a formal sense. So obviously like services, that's, it, that's a no, no, you know what I mean? Um, but like, in that situation that you're that you're bringing up, I mean, honestly, um, I would say it depends, right? Because there's going to be some people who are going to go to one extreme that I, I would consider an extreme, and they would make a scene about it. And I would say that's actually just as inappropriate as anything else, right? Um, is is making a big scene about it. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I think that. Um, depending on the situation, because obviously if you're there eating with people, right, there's a measure like, and, and it depends, right? If you know the people and everything like that, like, you know, bow your head, you know, cross yourself. I, I think that there is, because here's, here's the thing that I was hoping to get into, and this is a great segue. I do want to talk about those parts where I am ecumenical and, and I believe the church is ecumenical in that sense, right? So, it's disingenuous to act like there isn't an incredible amount of overlap between us and the Roman Catholics or us and the Oriental Orthodox. There's an incredible amount of overlap, more with Orientals than, you know, like there's an incredible amount. Um, and so, and so because of that, right, I think that there it is disingenuous and it's wrong to act like Catholics, Roman Catholics, you know, are pagans. Like, and, and some people want to act like that. That's, that's not, a, that's not right. That's not correct. You know what I mean? Um, because I, I'll just say this, you know, in like one week, we will be able to pray again, the, the, um, Oh, heavenly King prayer. Right. Well, heavenly king will come from the spirit of truth, whatever present and fillest all things, right? So obviously the Holy Spirit is, is working with everyone because if he wasn't, we wouldn't be doing this podcast because none of us here, except for maybe Cyprian because, you know, his wife is Russian and then like whatever. But other than that, we wouldn't, right? It, so obviously the Holy Spirit's doing something. So it's disingenuous to not acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit there. The problem, royal path, right? The problem is when people want to go too far and be like, it's all the same. It's not all the same because if it was all the same, right? The Holy, like, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have brought me to orthodoxy. Because again, I maintain, I, not, you didn't find the church, right? It was revealed to you. You know what I'm 100%, saying? 100%, 100%. So, so to me, like, that's the balance, right? And so I would say like, I would say when it comes to Roman Catholics, especially those who are traditionalists, those who, you know, are maybe even more disgusted because, you know, 
there's a greater sense of indifference on our end with what's going on with Rome, I would say, God bless you. You know what I mean? And I would say, uh, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, it's all happening because you're not Orthodox. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but, but, but God bless you and, and in God's timing, you know what I mean? Um, but I, to act like they're not, that, that, that's totally, that's not the case. You know what I mean? Um, but we, but we also have to acknowledge that there is a distinction. Like, you know, um, we don't, we aren't in communion. We don't want to be in communion, right? Like, and here, and here, let me, let me qualify what, what I mean by that. Uh, what we mean by don't want to be in communion is like, we don't want to compromise and capitulate the faith, right? So we would all love to see like schism is not cool, right? Schism isn't good. It's not a good thing, right? And what the world needs is a, a united witness. Jesus says, they'll know you by your love for one another, right? But let's just be clear. He's not talking about, are you guys, you know, sharing sodas and, and, and rap stacks? You know what I mean? Like that's, that's not what he's talking about by your love for one another. So what we what what the world needs is is absolutely a a shared witness of true Christian love and to have the East and the West united, um, to have the Eastern Church and the Oriental Churches united. I mean, the world would turn upside down in the best of ways. But what that would look like is uniting on truth and not just not just for the sake of uniting. You know, uniting yeah. for you know because because what because it's not uniting around christ because here's the thing the schisms aren't because of exclusively political or you know cultural issues they're they are dogmatic and theological issues right i'm almost tempted to run and grab um because i know it got brought up and i was going to put it in the comments um but if you guys think it's a good idea i was, I was tempted to run and grab and i, I can, can grab dance. some of those one of those some of those renunciations i can kinda... vape for a second cyprian and yeah, i yeah somebody asked somebody asked about that so that would be oh. yeah that would be excellent father yeah, yes. yeah yeah so cyprian how's your week been <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what you got yeah that's, that's what, what you got, got. <laughs> what's your what's your ideal sandwich because let me tell you something really quick yes go please oh not too long ago somebody I can't remember who, but I ended up with this piece of like fried, like chicken, like boneless chicken, right? Okay. Yeah, and so I put that, okay. I put that sucker on some whole wheat bread, like like okay. the nice stuff with a little yeah. bit of mayonnaise, some bacon. Okay. It's basically like a BLT with this piece of fried chicken in the middle. Okay. And like I took it to work, and no joke, two to three different people, I can't remember exactly, commented on it. They looked on it like that sandwich looks absolutely amazing and let me tell you it was it was absolutely amazing i'm still thinking about it. it's probably been a month what about you what's my, your ideal my sandwich? ideal sandwich i'm trying to think of what my ideal sandwich would be it's definitely includes melted cheese i'm thinking a chicken parm sandwich mm, that's good or an or nope that's what i'm going with chicken parm a chicken parm sandwich if we're going established sandwiches i would have to say every time i'm going to pick a reuben like reuben is without a you, doubt like did, my did favorite. you know this is like the the second time in three weeks that you've mentioned the reuben. and you, you know what? Really i'll make like a point mentioning it next week as well <laughs> like i'm just going to continue to say like <laughs> the reuben is the best sandwich i mean i it is i i've i've had it i'm not i mean i'm it's not my it's not my jammy but i will you know I'm German. I'll just say that if, again. If you love, if you love it, you love it, man. Like, yeah. what am I gonna say about it? You know okay. What I mean? what so, let's look at this here. Okay, so this is a uh, great book of needs, mm -hmm. and um, it's a book that us priests will use different prayers and stuff like that. So, um, so we. We talked about why this can't. We talked about her being brought into the church, the Ethiopian woman brought into the church. Did we talk about this last week about how this came up? In case we didn't, just in case a woman from the Ethiopian church was 
Chris made it into the Serbian Orthodox Church. And I had never seen that service before, but she basically renounced some teachings of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The but fourth... father had father had said at the time that for the Catholics there was more than for the Orthodox. There Orientals. is more. There is more. Yeah. Um, so so just just for that context, right? Like um uh So this is essentially it, right? Do you renounce, this is, this is if you're coming from a non Macedonian confession, right? So that's like Ethiopian, Indian, Coptic. Um, do you renounce the false opinion that in our Lord Jesus Christ, there are not two natures, divine and human, but only one, the human nature being slow divine. So that's the heresy of monof uh, monophysism, right? And so the, the monophysite heresy is basically that the nature of God is one singular nature, one unique nature blended uh, of like his humanity, his humanity is divinity. And so it's, it's problem. Um, and, you know, it's, we fundamentally reject that. Okay. But so that, so that's the one, right? And what's the correct teaching father, just in case the correct that teaching. There's Christ, Christ has two natures. He's fully God and fully man. Okay. Um, so that one, right, um, if you move into now, if you're, if, if Roman Latin, right, here we go. Do you renounce the erroneous doctrine that for the expression of the dogma concerning the procession of the Holy Spirit, which we talked about last week, the declaration of the Savior Christ himself who proceeds from the Father does not suffice, and that the addition and from the Son to the word of Christ himself is necessary. You, you renounce that, right? Do you renounce, that's one, do you renounce the erroneous supposition that does not suffice to confess Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the universal church, but that the Bishop of Rome is the head of the whole church? That's number two, you renounce that, right? Papism. Do you renounce the erroneous supposition that the Holy Apostles did not receive from our Lord Jesus Christ equal spiritual power, but the Holy Apostle Peter was their prince and the Bishop of Rome alone is his successor, and that the bishops of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and the others are not equally with the Bishop of Rome's successors of the Apostles? That's three, so you renounce that also. Um, do you renounce the erroneous understanding of those who think that the Pope of Rome is superior to the ecumenical councils and infallible? That's another one. Do you renounce all the doctrines of the Latin confession of faith, both, both old and new, which are contrary to the word of God and the true tradition of the church and to the degrees of the separate ecumenical councils? I renounce them. What is that? That's uh, uh, one, two, three, five. four, five, right? Uh, do you renounce the erroneous doctrine that for the expression of the dogma concerning the procession of the Holy Spirit, the declaration of the Savior himself, um who proceeds from the father and that the addition from the son to the word of christ himself is necessary to renounce it um do you renounce the erroneous opinion that in the eucharistic mystery the bread is not transformed into the body of christ yet does not become the body of christ and the wine is not transformed into the blood of christ it does not become the blood of christ excuse me um I moved into accidentally. Um, yeah, that, that should be Protestant, that Lutheran, right? Me, Lutheran, Lutheran, yeah. So we have the five to the one. And and that's not even that's not even this last that last one there, renouncing other doctrines, that's gonna get into um the back of the conception, mm -hmm. right? It's it's gonna get into all kinds of, of, of any type of also um practice that we would find you know problematic. And it's it's because I imagine if you were to actually kind of like begin to list them out, you know, you you kind of I don't say you'd be there all day, but you um, could be there are hour long videos lot. on this yeah there, there's a lot right so on the one hand <clears throat> i would say in a charitable sense someone would would say none of those things are really substantive right but i would say they absolutely are substantive in the sense of they those renunciations kind of get to the essence of the heart of where the error lies um without getting I don't want to say bogged down, but without getting um, too diffused in, in all of the kind of like specificities, like we were just talking about in regards of like, let's say the Immaculate Conception, right? So like, it's important to acknowledge that because those are some, some core things. And I think, I think what we talked about last week, it, it's almost like, I should have been nice to read those last week, whatever, because so much what I was trying to get at 
last week is is the is how the, all those things play out mm-hmm. how those renunciations really kind of address like this the um the kind of spiritual expression of 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 the roman church you know and so it's important to to recognize that because um those things that we find commonality in, you know, our love for, for the Holy Mother of God, all that, those, those things are good. And we absolutely have to affirm those things. Um, but I would say, because we affirm those things in love, and this is, this is the thing, this is my big point. For us, there's always going to be someone who's just doing it because they're more about being correct than they are about being, you know, a disciple of Christ. I get that. But fundamentally, the fathers understand the preaching against heresy and the preaching for the true faith and, and the true dogmas as an act of love. So that's what love is. I guess like that's the summative thing for tonight is that love is the adhering to, to the truth. Mm-hmm. That's the only way to understand love, right? To, to give in to that, to water down, to capitulate, it's not love right? It's, it's not true love or care for the other to the detriment of oneself, right? It's, it's fundamentally, you know, a, 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 um, I don't want to say a perversion, but it's, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely um, a, a moving away from that love as, it, as it's been revealed by the fathers, right? Because let's just be frank, you know, um, many have suffered and perished over those truths right and not not for 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 not for no reason you know would you gentlemen indulge me because like you said you didn't want to use the word perversion but i think that there's something i'm always about like and i should just be calling it i say logical progression but i should just be calling it fruits right like what predicting the fruits of where something like this goes right and if you gentlemen will indulge me, there was a, a, a tweet and a response that I saw today that to me is just indicative of this whole like, and also this, also this idea of how, how the ancients had it so right about what happens when you abandon truth. Right, like abandoning truth, abandoning like an orthodox view of things and where it goes. And I think you, you guys will, you guys will get this. Let me, if you, if you will, please indulge me on this because I was. It's like it's supposed to be a really came, awesome tweet. It came up today. It's from the New York Post. It's really the response that's the key. I hope you guys could see this. It's a new. Uh-huh. This is the New York Post, and it says, "I have ten different personalities." They all have their own names, ages, and opinions, right? So it's like immediately I was like, well, I am Legion, right? So okay. blue, this blue-haired individual. Now, here's what's so interesting. This top response says, aka 10 different Twitter accounts, right? This person's trying to be like cute. But look what comes after. This uh, uh, PhD, she, her, professor of women's studies, Gender, women's gender and sexual studies Trans with the rainbow. Marxist critique of heteronormative dystopia. Wow. That makes right. Now sense. check this out. What she said. It is critical for the mental health of those with disassociation to nurture and develop their individual personalities. This is the crap I suspect I'm your comment was made in jest, but it would actually be a positive outlet. And like on love, this was when you were talking about like, this is not love. No. Nurturing nurturing mm. demons that's inside exactly of a person it is. is not love no. it's love for demons yeah but it's not incredible. love for man that's incredible and it's just like this because i think that people would say like oh well what's the like it doesn't make sense like what's the big deal and it's like no 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 this is actually where it goes mm-hmm. like when you refuse to stick to objective truth when you refuse to pursue truth you get this and we know you get this because we got it well hey guys well well the other portion of that though is and remember when people used to say i i I used to i had people toss this at me a lot in 2020 and 2021 
and the whole like that's a slippery slope like that's gonna <laughs> like that's gonna deter me right <laughs> yeah let, let, let me let me tell you something that that person that thing right there mm-hmm. that's a setup for murder yeah it wasn't me it, it was yeah. it was it yeah. was anthem it was yeah. anthem and kerfuffle mm-hmm. it was my other two personalities they're the ones who who killed those kids it wasn't me mm-hmm. oh you poor thing okay mm-hmm. you know what i mean wow yeah what if like a person commits a murder and then like five years later get caught for it and they're like i no longer identify as that person yeah like that's, that's not coming. my that's not my identity that's coming. I, that's I don't know coming. if it's coming i have no idea oh no it's but... it's it's definitely coming i mean there's no if you could because here's the thing if you can say it if you can think it the individual who's who's doing this can, they they're they're 20 steps beyond you yeah they're 20 steps beyond you in terms of the corruption that's happening. Yeah. And the slippery slope, the person who would hear that and be like, oh, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. That's a slippery slope. You don't have love. I'm like, and that that person also is not, they, they have no concept of love. That's right? kind of, that was what I was going to end up saying earlier, which is just like, I, I could say something to someone and it might could be quote unquote harsh. But it's like, it, you know, and I try not to do that because I don't really want to be that. I don't like saying things, you know, there's not like some part of me that gets really happy by saying mean things. But it's like, but that doesn't feel like love, like telling a person like whatever stupid thing is on, you know, this week that people are on about. It's like, no, you know, I don't believe that. They're like, well, that doesn't feel like love. And they'll be like, well, I would propose to you. You don't know what love feels like then. Yes. And like that's and like this, like there's a big difference between like St. Paul walking. Like, I mean, was any, was St. Paul ever like concerned about self care? Like he's like, guys, I know I've walked Seems like, like no. 600 like miles no. in the last like two months, you know, whatever. I just really need to take some self care. You know, I need some time. I really feel like I've used all of my me. Then you know, like the thing that I was thinking about too, is um, one of the things that we never, not we here, but we as a society never really look at is how absolutely dehumanizing and patronizing those dispositions are. I mean, it, for me, it was kind of like, and I've been on this tip for, for a while, you know, for obvious reasons, but it's like one of the biggest problems I have had um, with a lot of the kind of like Neo, um, kind of like neo, like the critical race theory, like the, it's how absolutely patronizing mm. um, it is to like, like in, in one instance, like black folk, right? But just in general, these tendencies really seek to remove, um, you know, there's this word that's used, which people actually look at it as a distasteful bad word, but personal responsibility, like mm. personal responsibility. I'm not, I'm not being facetious personal responsibility in certain leftist um, kind of centrist, left centrist like circles is, is a pejorative term used to describe, you know, hyper conservative, you know, Bill Cosbyites or something like that. And it's, it's, it's a real setup, if you guys are understanding what I'm saying, because the idea is that people, this, we talked about this before about the cult of, of victimhood, the power of the victim, yep. right? Yep. And the exchange of victimhood for personhood is, is, is a, it's like selling your soul to the devil. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, well, it's exactly it's, what it is, right? It's selling your soul to the devil, you know? And, and that, that's fundamentally the same thing that's happening. Like that doctor, that PhD with her Ukrainian flag and, and all that yeah. stuff, like. Um, you know, she's a good person because she's got a Ukrainian flag. You know, like these, and, and, and this is fundamentally you know, it's just so tough because so much of this is unfortunately polemical, but that's what I point to when I look up so much of the mental health industry is mm-hmm. just basically a launching point, a disseminator of, you know, at best worldly perspectives, but in actuality, just kind of like demonic antichrist viewpoints. Yep. Oh. Just to get, you know, I mean, that's just... It absolutely is. I mean, 
you know, I'm not an expert in many things, but this is one field I am, you know, I have a degree in it, you know, not a big deal, but you know, like one of the things that continues to, to like, I had a, uh, a woman who was a really, really, really afraid to cut her daughter off, even though her daughter was, you know, breaking all of her rules. You know, she's like 30 years old or something like that, living in her mom's house, drinking all the time. No regard for her mom. And her mom was basically saying, like, I'm so terrified that, um, you know, that she is so trauma. She has so much trauma. And so many in so much PTSD, which, by the way, those words don't hardly mean anything anymore. No. And, 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 you know, they do, but they don't. And, you know, um, if you come home from a war, they do. That's 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 my facetious. I'll just say this really quick. That's my facetious little question. Whenever I ask, whenever people I'm talking to people on the phone, like, well, my PTSD, I'm like, oh, I didn't know you were a veteran. Right. And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm not a veteran. I'm like, oh, OK. Oh, okay. That Okay, sure. Yeah. But um, they they'll uh, this mom was basically saying, like, if I throw her out, I don't know what's going to happen to her trauma. You know, I don't know what's going to happen to her mental health. And, you know, like, does she can she even get sober? And my example I always use is like, like, there's people in AA who watch their kids get run over and die. Mm -hmm. And that person is able to stay sober. You know, that person is able to stay sober one day at a time. And that's the bar. If she's got something worse than that, let me know. And then we can talk. But until then, you know, like, and so the the nurturing of that, it's like this whole like, poor you, poor you. It was never fair for you. You did those things. You know, you did those things because you, you never really had a chance, you know, like they, your parents, it's capitalism, the patriarchy, white people, they all immediately, even if you're white, even if your parents aren't divorced, you know, it, you know, even if you're living in a nice area of town in a $1,200 a month apartment, you know, working a 60. Well, 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 it's, well, so, well. it's so Hold evil on. though. Hold on. I got to so say this evil, though, you know, I got to say this though. That's exclusively who that is though. Always. It's always that like, yeah. <laughs> it, it's always, it's always, it's always those people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because the people that I've known who, you know, <laughs> the, the people that I've walked with, um, you know, when I was trying to tell them about them having trauma, they're like, whatever, you know what I mean? They, yeah. they just try to keep it moving. Right. Yeah. So like that, see, and, and I think, I think we need to like, I, I want to just kind of hone in that real quick because past the kind of like complaining of everything there's something really insidious to what we we're just to what you were just talking about and antichrist yeah i mean it, it's this the depersonalization and the and the and the seeking to remove the the personhood like so what's interesting is um when you study when you, when you study the 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 the, the anti antichrist the the anti god movements of the communists specifically the romanians at the top of the list and then moving kind of down from there um something it, it's very interesting because it, it was of such a psychological nature um and that the idea of trying to remove personhood through actual trauma, right? Like, you know, prolonged beatings, slept, sleep, deb um, sleep deprivation, torture, torture, torture. torture. Um, that was actually a thing, right? And and this is, you know, anyone wants to read a good book, seeing the prisons, I would recommend it to everyone, you know, like understanding what people endured what Christians endured, what Orthodox Christians endured during those times will, will show you something. But the point I want to get at is <clears throat> these movements to really remove the personhood of individuals. What ceased these programs from, from existing is always people getting word outside of like the horrors of what's happening. You, you understand what I'm saying? Whether it's the Nazis or the remains, like there's 
some way, somehow the outside world gets outside world gets word of it. And then it's like, you know, there's there's this kind of like what in the world's going on there? You know what I mean? Well, the the grotesque, shocking nature of that level of kind of like physical torture, it, its dividends are only so big, if that makes sense, right? Because, because at some point in time, you can't hide it. And it, once people are shocked, then the, the jig is up, right? Are you, are you it's, like, it's like a it's like an early version because of its crudeness yeah in a way yeah yeah you sure i'm going with this i see where you're going yes now you can have it going in perpet in perpetuity right Be because well, the new york the new york post is like yep, yep. advertising it yep yep <laughs> okay i'm yep. sorry I missed. Advertising and so, and so that's the thing that is like really crazy and scary because so not only can it now go on, you know, and <laughs> I can't talk tonight for some reason, but perpetually, like forever, it can just keep going on. But like, you'll have people joining in with it now, like, because celebrating it, they'll celebrate it in the name of love and the name of all these things. Right. And so bringing this back around, it's like, this absolutely has everything to do with ecumenism yes. because this is why you have so many quote unquote Christian confessions backing this garbage because they can say in the name of Jesus, listen, I got, I got a, like, I sit on my porch in my beautiful house. I sit on, sit on my porch. I can look across the street from my porch and I can see this. I'm assuming it's a Methodist church and like their big sign with the rainbow was, flag was a rainbow flag. Well, a couple like a week and a half ago they painted over they i was like oh okay well you know praise god maybe maybe something's happening you know um which little side note just so everyone knows like it's one of my it's one of my big heartbreaks that the rainbow flag was hijacked like that because the mm -hmm. rainbow is like one of my most favorite symbols it's such a beautiful uh symbol anyways um we can get into that too like but they, they painted over and it's like, okay, great, cool, whatever. I was walking my dog. Uh, and then like, I came back around like two days later with my daughter and I was like, Ugh. Oh no. Yeah. Is painted it, Ukraine? Ugh, no. Oh. I'm, sur I'm surprised <laughs> they didn't. I'm joke. Surpri I love it. <laughs> I I'm surprised they didn't know. They painted over the rainbow flag and, and so they could paint in the trans triangle and the rainbow flag. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah. are they're adding letters. Yeah. They they did they yeah. did the LGBTQ plus yeah. Yeah. minus asterisk. Yeah. They needed to add in the they needed to add in that you know 70s triangle thing. So like I bring that up because again, you know, um this is how insidious it is now, right? You you don't need godless communists shoving the heads of priests in excrement. And, and beating them, uh, you know, senseless without, you know, going, going without sleep for, you know, five, six, seven days. Like, you don't need that anymore. Um, you can just um, talk about, you know, microaggressions. You can promote it um, in children's schools. You can get parents who are supposed to be Christians to sign off on it and to let them think that it's not a big deal. And they watch as their children um, become animals and, and care more about their sexual appetites than personhood. You know what I mean? Like, like that's, that's where it's at. And that's why it's so much more insidious. And, you know, again, like maybe because I'm a Generation X guy, I don't know. I just saw this thing about, you know, us being some some bad mofos, I guess, because we were, we were raised by baby boomers, like all this stuff. But like, I'm just going to tell you something like for those, I know one person out there at least knows me, right? Like from back in the day. So like, like I've hung around some people, you know what I mean? I've, I've hung, I've hung around some people uh, and I've been in some, you know, some dicey situations and I'm, I'm going to tell you from experience, not from, not from my, um, my hallowed, halls of, of religion i'm telling you as someone who is like in there with the best of them you know 
to a point. Uh, people who are living in that lifestyle are miserable. They're miserable. They're miserable. Um, That's okay because being miserable is normalized. You know, and so like, I think that what we have to really begin to understand is that, you know, the whole purpose, the whole reason why the church exists is to, is to, you know, be, be a light and bear witness to the nations. And, you know, <laughs> how dark is your, if your, if your eye, if the light of your eye is dark, how, how dark is that darkness? You know what I mean? Like, when you have so many quote unquote Christian confessions and all these Christians who are just rapidly supporting and defending this, it's, 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 it's a sad state, you know? And I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, talking about, I don't know if it's going to make it in this. So at some point in time, we're talking about that NPR hit piece, you know? Um, but, but this is one of those things where, you know, again, yeah, I've said this before. Someone shouldn't come to the Orthodox Church because they're it's the most conservative branch and you're fleeing the the kind of, you know, liberal hordes. Like come for that reason, but that's not why you stay. Right? You stay because you find Jesus Christ in all his in all his fullness and all his truth, right? Um but that being said, you know, I I think the reality is that not i'm not talking about uh hierarchs whatever i'm talking about like orthodoxy or orthodoxy can never capitulate to that because orthodoxy is the revelation of, of jesus christ and in, in, in the life of his people and so because of that all the stuff that we see the ecumenism this is all happening because of it you know what i mean because listen the whole reason why people have an idea of like what people call, consider fairness and decency, you know, all this stuff, like basically all of these movements that would talk about everything from microaggressions to all this stuff, it all comes out of a, a perverted Christian ethic, a Christian morality. That, that's what these people don't understand, right? Um, all of these, like, all of the, <laughs> the enlightenment, right for as twisted whatever i mean the alignment was possible because it 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 twisted christian morality you know what i mean um and so all of these liberal in in the sense you know liberalism in the classic sense right all these liberal views they are all birthed out of a christian ethic and morality but now they're perverted and twisted are you guys following me on this right no yeah 100% Father Sarah from Rose talked about this and he said that like Catholicism, like the, you know, this is his words and I'm just quoting him. Catholicism ultimately led it like to communism. Yeah. Like you can, you can make that line from like Catholicism. Da, 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 well, it's da. an easy line to draw. Yeah. Yeah. It's an yeah. easy line to draw. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Quoting a father there. Yes. But I think, I think ultimately, I think what, the whole nefarious thing of it is is that i mean i i don't really know this is just again like father said boots on the ground type of thing is ultimately like all it teaches people is to be like like normalizing misery and that's quite the, the misdirect is because then it's like it's not your actions it's not your quote unquote and i'm not even talking about like homosexuality but like you know, just your, you know, you're normalizing looking at porn all the time or whatever your sexual, you're like your sexual perversions that are giving you anxiety and causing your soul to be in pain and you can never feel right. Or the fact that, you know, you recreationally use drugs like all the time. And I don't, I don't fault anyone for that. You know, like I certainly have done my fair share or sleeping in or working a job from home or never leaving your apartment or not exercising because quote unquote, like you don't have enough energy or just so exhausted quote unquote all the time another word that doesn't mean anything anymore when people say i'm just exhausted i'm like i bet you are exhausted because doing nothing is exhausting and it's really That's difficult so <laughs> and like 
um th- like this idea of being like i think we talked about it a long time ago it's it's gnosticism to a degree because it, you know it's like you're breaking down the material it's it's you know you you don't you know you're you're basically being disassembled and being told it's okay to be disassembled like we're talking like the extremes here we're talking like your hyper I, i'm sorry that your hyper woke you know folks that you know they're they're anxious and miserable and depressed you know blah 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 which i don't blame them but like the reasons why are not their fault you know it's it's all no, ex- it's all external it's, it's all external, external. Yeah. yeah and then once you're in a victim sense of mind then you know well then who is this god guy anyway right but see let, and let and but it is it. external though because it's, it's it right. is demons it is yes. external 100 <laughs> yeah. well well let's 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 understand this too because this gets into things about like man i mean the, we could do a whole other show about things like well maybe we'll get to that with, with baptism but like you know demons acting externally versus within because there's a distinction the father's teaching and if you have experience you know there's a difference you know and why am I bringing this up? Because this also gets into the ecumenism in regards of like fundamental, very important and fundamental things become compromised, ignored, or twisted from w- when you begin to wantonly engage in ecumenical thought, dialogue, all that. You you start snipping and cutting and twisting things in such a way that you begin to almost become unable to recognize the the visage of of truth anymore right and that is talking about dismantling you begin to dismantle christ right and 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 again right well that truth is like hideous you can't like yeah i mean because because here's part of the thing is what what we have understood as orthodox is that it's it's us who can't handle it so basically what we've decided is we will you know what i look for to see if someone's ready for baptism essentially is do you understand that you will need to change not the church that that if if that person understands, and I think to the best of ability, if God's help, they understand that, okay, great. Because everything else you can learn and whatever. As long as understands, like, I don't like something, but you know what? I'm, I'm the one who has to change. Once you understand that, then your ability to apprehend and to encounter and commune with Christ, really, I mean, the, the doors are wide open. And that is one of the key problems with ecumenism is that it seeks to say, well, there are certain things that we can, we can just say are negotiable. But the problem is, is like, well, how, like, how do you deem that? How do you deem something that's negotiable? Because if your confession says, well, we're, we're holding this as a dogma or a doctrine, well, clearly you came to that conclusion, your confession came to that conclusion for a reason, right? And, and this is where it becomes problematic because for me, I, I, it, someone could say I, I'm speaking in two sweeping of generalities and abstractions. Maybe I am, but like I have to because if you try to become too pedantic and talk about specific details, you lose, you lose sight of the picture in the same way. It's like zoning in on Andrew's one freckle. You will lose the totality of the person, yeah. right? So you have to speak about like the spirit of things so that you can, you can understand how all of this actually, you know, plays out. And I, and, and I bring this up because when we start looking at how the church transforms us, right. When you start introducing, which is happening in, a, in like a certain jurisdiction, which I say is like the largest jurisdiction, you know what I mean? And their archbishop is, you know, I don't know, like, yeah. Whatever. Uh, huh? Whatever. Yeah, like, like whatever. Like, the things that are coming out from this this hierarch, who's the hierarch over the largest jurisdiction of Orthodox Christians in America, like the things that are coming out, it 
it's almost, this is going to sound very odd. It's almost the most charitable thing you can say is that it has to be like nefarious and on purpose. Yes. Yeah. Like, because, because the only other option is, is that, are, are you just like, the incompetence is too high yeah the competence yeah. is just it's it's yeah. too high you know yeah. what i mean it's too yeah. high so mm -hmm. so you know this is this is the other side of it which we didn't get into which that would have been much more fun tv i have a feeling there's a part two to this i'm just yeah i, I have a because I, I i think the audience will generate a part there's two, I have there's a so much more and i didn't even get into the part because i do think the point is, is, and we're going to wrap up here in just a second. Yeah. We don't have to, but I kind of have I to. I thought we just yeah. skimmed the we, surface. Yeah. Like, this is, I, I just want to go on the record. Uh, this is, tonight was tough because I, I feel like I haven't even said anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, just, it feels like it was just. But um, the thing that, the thing that I'll say really quick, I, I'm sorry. It, the thing I want to say is, is that. I'm a layman. Uh, I, I'm. I have. I hold no office other than layman. But the thing that I have seen is, is that the stuff that we are talking about, and I will give an example in just one second. But the stuff that we are talking about, it seems small. It seems trite, and I have an example of that in just one second. But the diff. But the problem is, is like with most things, once you kind of look into it, it's like this two natures of Christ thing. There's like three or four father, I'm sorry, three or four councils dealing with just of the seven dealing with just the nature of Christ, like the two natures of Christ and like how that works. And the point is, is that one, uh, I, when the, when these councils come together, it's not because the church is confused. Like I kind of stupidly said in another episode, it's because there's been a challenge to that. So the revelation is there and there's a challenge to that. So, all that being said is part of an agenda and like the, the end of the dismantling an entire generation, blah, blah, blah of people and thinking, you know, wallow, you know, wallow and mope is, is that that is a very, very, um, that is a very good field to plant things into fertile ground. A very fertile ground. And it's very fertile ground for a certain agenda, which is, you know, not Christian or, some would the say AC in agenda. place of Christian. Yes. Yeah. So the example I was going to use is, is that uh, there's a, the, you know, part of the uh, Orthodox Church just uses the Gregorian calendar versus the Julian. Now, if you were to talk to average Joe Schmo on the street about old calendar versus new calendar, and they would say something like, well, why does that matter? You know, it doesn't really matter. And it does matter. And I'll tell you, like, it matters in a huge way because not even let's not even talk about the the i don't know if i'm using the term the bishop or the patriarch father that introduced it yeah it's patriarch it's the Thenoboros, yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we say that name and then we spit on the ground um and yeah yeah um because you know it was like that part in arrested development i don't know if everyone's seen it but like he's like trying to investigate a banana stand burning down and so he's like so he did a little detective work and he turned around and he's like hey did you burn down the banana stand and like almost definitely like right away like the answer is given and i was like i wonder if there's a certain organization of bricklayers yeah of bricklayers who maybe have infiltrated no. And then turned around and almost oh, definitely it's this guy right here. He did it right here and was very, very, very open about it. So aside from that, aside from that, like that issue, there is the issue of like turning the church to a whole new calendar. And like to some people that might not seem like a big deal. It might seem like it's pedantic. It might seem like we're needlessly sticking tradition, but that's not true. That's not true. And we can get into that next episode, but I mean, I'm just saying like, there are things like that, which like to the outside, you know, it's like Cleveland. Yeah. Let me say this real quick too. Cause this is a good point. Like there's a couple different ways you can look at that with a calendar issue. I want to just throw out two things that people don't know or think about that are important. Um, Okay, yes, the calendar issue was tough. And like, yes, it turned the church away from her tradition. But I would, I would submit to someone, think of it in this way, and maybe you'll, have, you'll come to a different opinion, meaning those who think it's not a big deal, right? Um, 
it's not so much that it turned the church away from her tradition, but it turned the, it tried to turn the church more towards the world. Mm -hmm. if, if you understand that, right. It had more to do with about turning the, the, the church towards the world. That's the first thing. But on the other hand, you see, and this is this is you know getting back to the the royal path portion of this right like trying to really bring this home um understand something from my experience personally and pastorally it's never really the initial offense that's the problem you know what i mean it's 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 not why did you overeat tonight it's not like, why were you looking at porn, right? It's the, it's the underneath of that, or more importantly, where that's moving you towards. Because the despair that you're falling into because you fell into porn again is actually the, that's the real goal of the enemy, mm. right? If, if, if you follow what I'm saying. So like um, St. Joseph the Hesychast, you, uh, you're on the Joseph, when he was on the Holy Mountain, he, well, he was always on the Holy Mountain, but he, it's interesting because he sympathized with when, because he was on Athos when the calendar issue happened, mm. right? And he sympathized with the old calendars, right? Like, he's like, yeah, like, they're, they're correct, right? And they, they were like, you know, really courting to get his support, because they're like, if we can get you know, because everyone respects him, even if they don't like him, they got they respect him. You know, if we can get Yoranda Joseph on our side, like you know, that'll be a big thing for us. And so he prayed about it. And what the what the spirit showed him was they were correct in regards of the calendar issue, meaning that it shouldn't have been changed, but they were even they were in even greater error in, in their zeal for it. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is really where the devil sought to strike because remember the real path, like every like quantitatively, right? So much of the church fell for it in regards of like leaving the cat, leaving the like to, more, turning towards the world, embracing the world, right? But the qualitative hit actually came in, in so many of the schisms that were that were a, a factual on the right hand by the old calendarists right because so like when you think of schism now in in the 20th and 21st century the first first schisms you think about are the calendars old calendarists right and that's a whole other that's a whole other conversation right but where did that come from it, it was a move of the devil right because it's like yeah they're correct but the but the how in which they go about it becomes that that was his real intent was to get them to kind of to fall into schism. It, it was agree? the, it was uh, it, the, what it was about was arbitrary. It was like the real point is to get you to fall into schism. The real point was to yeah. get the people to fall into schism through their, through heresy and their opinions. Right. And, yeah. and, yeah. and so this is, this is, I want to kind of almost wrap up on this point because Maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there should be a part two and yep. maybe we can actually have a little bit more like um, uh, a little more direction with it. Cause like the thing I want to kind of really point tonight is um, the problem with talking about ecumenism is that it's very, this is one of the places where like, maintaining and seeking the real path is of the utmost importance mm -hmm. because we've talked a lot about the left side of things and falling off into liberalism and, and relativism and subjectivism but there's a whole nother even darker side that can happen um where another kind of atrocities can happen and, and, and schisms and and this kind of like fall into pride mm -hmm. this fall into the type of correctness that's that's pharisaical right because if the liberals are there the if the people falling off the left side of the path are there with the harlot caught in adultery you know but they but they're mad that jesus says go and sin no more the other side of that are the pharisees 
yes. for wanting to stone her. And so like, you don't want to be in that place either. And unfortunately, I have to say this, right? Roll path. There is a lot of people who they, they get real close to falling off the right edge. Lots of people when you start, you know, um, who okay. I will be in agreement with in regards of like, yeah, I'm definitely not an ecumenist at all. You know what I mean? But I also see very clearly that danger of falling off to the right side and, and not being Christian. You're just a Pharisee, right? It just doesn't do anything. You know what I'm saying? So this is, this is important to understand, you know? Yeah, I agree. As a person that like when I woke up from everything, I got really angry. Not not livid. I wasn't punching anything, but I was like really angry. And suddenly I was just like, you're not doing that right. You're not doing that right. And not like too much outwardly, but inwardly. Like that is that's a very real danger to fall into that other side. And honestly, I, I, I'd say that side is it feels stonier to me anyway, than like the other side. So anyway um i think there should be a part two i don't know if that's gonna happen who knows a week is a long time we can change our mind you know and we're allowed to do that so um do you guys have any uh cool stories about some some saints or... I've, I've got i've got one all right it's for this one stood out to me to it's actually it's actually for today but it stood out um it's well for for me today is tuesday here in saipan it's okay it's monday for you guys Brag. And it's the uh, Holy Martyrs David and Terry Chan from Georgia, 693. What I found so interesting about, so they're young. It's two brothers. They uh, are born into a pious Christian family. They're relatives of the king. And their father dies when they're young. And the, the brother, their uncle, Theod Theodosius took all the family's possessions and so this guy he's trying to prevent he's trying to make sure that he could have this when they get older like to keep the inheritance and so first he tries to convert the mother to his pagan faith and she says she says no you seize my son's estate you're not going to seize their spiritual inheritance uh as well so then he moves on to the son's and he starts like being real kind to them and everything. And then he tries to, to bring them over. And he's like, turn away from the faith of your father. I'll show you a better way. And they both say, no, they say, we're prepared to suffer everything for the love of our Lord and heavenly father. Right. So now he gets kind of upset about this whole thing. Their mother realizes his sister realizes that he's going to try to kill these guys, the, the, the two kids. And she takes, she takes them to another region in the south of Georgia and they start herding sheep. There's like, they, they become shepherds and he's been, this Theodosius guy, he's been searching for them, right? So it's, he's got some spies. He sends some spies to kill them, to kill both of them. And uh, the brothers ran away from these spies and the uncle was there. They saw the uncle. The first one comes up He's got his staff. He sees his uncle. He's like, oh, uncle, you know, save me. Throws his staff down. A tree comes up. A tree grows up. And it says 200 years later, these Christians chopped the tree down and divided the holy wood among themselves. But then the uncle grabs the, the boy, the first boy, David, and he and he kills him like with the with the knife. Then the other one, Tari Chan, runs and uh, he, he's killed as well by the spies. They follow him. What happens after that, though, this is the part that I found so interesting and, and like really called out to me is the uncle, when the soldiers come back from after killing the, killing the, uh, killing Tari Chan, they come back to the uncle. The uncle is now, has now been struck blind. Mm -hmm. So he's completely blind. He can't see anymore. And the soldiers can't speak. They're like stuck in place and they can't speak anymore after this. And the, the mother comes and starts to uh, denounce him. And uh, he, but he, he, feels, he feels what he's done, starts crying. And then he, the, the mother 
is like there she sees denouncing and he he falls into basically repentance and he says uh on you has shown the inextinguishable light from the unapproachable and true light the eternal light pray to the holy martyrs that the lord have mercy on me and make me the unworthy worthy of the seal of christ the all merciful god who came into the world indeed he is the one true god and so when she heard those words she she said that like her sons were a holy sacrifice she realized they had been a holy sacrifice she took some of the earth up from the ground that was stained with the blood and put it on his eyes and his sight was restored hmm. and he actually went he repented it he repented he was baptized he erected a church in honor of david and then they built another church over the holy holy relics but what i found so interesting was that he was that this guy after killing two saints after basically martyring saints was then his sight was restored mm. and that he was then brought into the church in his repentance and baptized and then is and and then so it's like that god was working through even this murder so evil mm -hmm. like that his actions were so evil but that he was delivered and it was just like it's so wild to me mm -hmm. and it just really called it really called out to me i don't know i read that one today and i was just like because we read all these stories of the martyrs and it's like oh the evil you know the person who killed them evil sometimes they they repent sometimes their torturers repent but yeah this one in particular i don't know it just yeah you know called out to me today it that's powerful because again um you know there's I, we talked about it before but causing the good to become causing the even the evil causing the evil to be good Mm -hmm. as it says in the prayer of saint basil in saint basil's liturgy like that's the power of god right to mm -hmm. take even despicable evil acts and turn i mean turn them into something because yes he was healed and yes there was his repentance but he built churches and then like you know what i'm saying like who knows what else came of that, right? And so, mm -hmm. like their mother said, they were a sacrifice. They were an offering, right? And it's like the Lord said, if a kernel of wheat goes falls to the ground, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth fruit a hundredfold, right? And so, this is this is an encouraging thing to us because so oftentimes it's like the way that we want the story to resolve it doesn't bear as much fruit as, as if you, you actually carry that thing all the way through sometimes to, you know, our perspective. And that's the thing of so oftentimes, most times we won't see the fruit of our labor, mm. you know, to the glory of God. You know what I mean? I mean, what if St. Saba had won? Yeah. I mean, like he would just be another guy who won a victory, you know, like he might've been a saint, you know, but like, he might have just been like another Balkan general that beat. Oh, Lazar, Lazar, Lazar. Oh man, what did I Lazar. say? I'm he so sorry. Lazar. I'm sorry. Lazar. 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 Forgive me. Um, it's late. I'm sorry, guys. Um. Uh. Yeah. I mean, he just would have been another guy. Like yeah. Napoleon's cool and all, but I mean, you know. So. Um. Anyway. Uh. Yeah. I think that's it for us tonight. Um. So I'm going to go ahead and plug the, uh, pod, the podcast playlist on Spotify. Why not? Sure. Um, I'm sure that there'll be uh, comments from this. Let's keep it civil, gentlemen and ladies. And um, let's, you know, let's not throw, hurl any accusations. Maybe, maybe pray before you type anything. I would say that. Like maybe because I, I'm so guilty that sometimes of just like. Well, actually, I would say this too. Um, this would be good. I engaged a lot last week with um, some of the comments, you know. Um, it's people want to actually um, ask some questions that might help give a little bit of 
form and direction if if we do want to do yep. a part two yep um because there's just so much to cover and it's just it's tough you know so maybe that's something else people can like if there's questions you know um we can uh kind of gather those and and, and work off of that we'll see no, no. and hey guys it's tricky okay it's tricky because we're trying to be truthful but diplomatic and not offensive you know it's tricky so I, I don't want you to, I don't want, we're not trying to compromise on anything, but we're also not trying to be jerks. Like that's kind of the point. Hey, don't be a jerk. Just don't be a jerk unless you need to be, but don't be a jerk because that's its own problem. So anyway, that's it. Thank you everyone. And um, yeah, that's it. Oh, thank you. All right. Bye-bye.